Welcome world history students to uh, lesson three. Uh, we are now in our sixth week of DLP. Uh, we will be having three lessons this week, three lessons next week, and that will make a total of eight uh, before our next test on the Renaissance. And remember, you will not be having a final. Uh, you will just be doing a unit test over the Renaissance uh, uh, during that last week, around the 18th or 19th of May. Um, in dealing with this lesson three, last time we were talking about, the, or the, actually the first two lessons, we were talking about the steps or the path of the Renaissance and how we went from the Middle Ages to this age where uh, people had uh, grown in literacy, grown in skill development, grown in uh, expanding their horizons as far as travel or in business. And so now we're into this next part and we began, or last time we talked about a little bit, uh, the development of the guilds, which was number six in our steps or the path that they took. And we were in these guilds that were developed because towns began to build around these market areas and craftsmen began to move there uh, to be able to make their crafts and then sell at the markets or sell at the fairs that when several of these same type of skilled laborers or merchants moved into an area, they had to get together and work out a business plan so they would not overlap each other's territory. And so that was how the development of the guilds began. And it was not just in merchants and craftsmen, but also in education. And we're gonna look at that in just a minute because they eventually provided schools. Uh, the schools that they provided uh, were basically for the children that whose parents or fathers were a part of the guild and they would establish a school there um, but they also did several other things like I said we're going to get back to the whole idea of the school but they cared for the poor so they uh, actually had a benevolence fund that people gave to uh, that were part of the guild in case someone in the guild had an emergency or something happened um, uh, where they couldn't conduct their trade through an accident or something like that uh, then they would be able to provide for this family until they could get back on their feet or uh, the sickness had been overcome or the injured people had been replaced. Uh, they would be able to help support them. So there was care for the poor that were associated with their community as well as these aids for members in need. Okay, um, And these, like I said, in the beginning were merchant and crafts. But because they started school and education started to expand, and there was so much knowledge coming in through travel, uh, through the acquisition of books. Um, people really started to desire to be educated because they knew that was part of the, the idea of the Renaissance, uh, this path of darkness to light. Uh, but in this, before we get to the aspect of education, uh, as far as the universities go and the development of schools, uh, there was an educational process that began to develop during this time period. It is something that is still used today. Matter of fact, we still use these three terms of apprentice, journeyman, and master. And I actually believe this is probably the most effective way of education. One-on-one -on -one types of education where a person who is interested in a particular study or field of study, a particular trade, they meet with a master, the master teaches them everything they know, and then they develop their own masterpiece. And that's basically this style of education. I think we've gone away from that with the masses and we put more people in to make more money and there's not that personal contact. So there's not that much change of information or exchange with questions and answers. And I think we've lost a lot in our education system today because it's got too big. It's got, got too corporate. And so if we could get back to this apprentice journeyman and master program, I think we would have a higher level of development and understanding as far as skills and trades go. So let's break this down. We're going to put down some key facts here about each one of these positions. Okay, so first of all, the apprentice. And please write these down underneath um, the apprentice here. For, so first of all, your parents paid for your education, uh, paid for your training uh, to a master. So when you were, and this is a common thing, and we've seen this in several of the ancient civilizations, at around seven to ten years of age, you would be taken and put into a position where um, you could become a, a, an apprentice to someone. Uh, sometimes it started a little bit later, uh, but it, it could be as early as seven years of age. 
Uh, and you lived with the master within his family. So not only did you learn the trade, you still had family chores and things that you had to do within the master's house. It required absolute obedience to the master, which is something we've actually really gone away from because we all are independent and we have our own way and you can't treat me like this. And we've learned uh, through our independence to be super independent and people can't tell us what to do anymore. Um, you trained for two to seven years, depending on what the skill was. Uh, the more advanced the skill, the longer the training. The less advanced the skill, because uh, some things you know, are artsy as well as um, uh, skilled. Okay? And so depending on how artsy were placed with the skill and how complex the skill was, was the length of your training. Uh, and this was interesting too. Uh, you weren't allowed to marry until you finished training. And the reason is, is because they wanted you to be able to focus on your training, your education, and when that was accomplished, then you could have the cares of this world placed upon you, taking care of your own uh, needs, taking care of a spouse, things of that nature, even children later on. Because with all those, those obligations take away from your development and your training is what they believe. And then once your training was done and the master taught you everything that you knew and you were actually able to repeat everything skill-wise, with your hands, what the master taught you to do, you would become a journeyman. So that means you were released from apprenticeship and the guild, it wasn't just the master, the guild had to agree to this too. The guild would say, okay, now you're a journeyman. Now you move into a different category. So you're called a day worker, which means you don't live with your master anymore. You can live on your own, you can get married, you can start a family, but you are considered a day worker. And you also work six days a week. Monday through Saturday, Lord's Day off, all right? Um, you worked for a master and you were paid a salary. So because you could live on your own and you didn't have to live with a master anymore, he would actually pay you. And then um, in order to go from journeyman to master, and while you're working for the master, you had to do your six days a week work for the master. But during that time period, on your own time, you could develop a masterpiece, so if you were in the trade of, uh, let's say you were making shoes, then you would have to work as a cobbler for this cobbler, this master cobbler, making shoes, and then on your own, make your own special that would be considered your masterpiece or your signature pair. All right? And then once that has been approved by your master, that masterpiece is taken to the guild, and then the guild would then vote on it. Yes, this is good. You can receive master status. So it took a, a period of time for this to happen. And it wasn't until you were much older, most of the time until you're in, in your thirties, would you ever, ever able to become a master. Okay. And so you had to be accepted by the guild and declared a master. And then if you went to any other town, you took that recognition and that symbol or that signature from the guild saying this person is a master in this trade. And then you would be able to be considered a master in other areas because guild, other guilds would accept it in other towns. Okay, And a master uh, owned his own shop, worked with other masters to protect the trade in the guild. So you're the ones, if you look uh, at the previous picture, there was a group of um, masters meeting there. Those are the ones who, journeymen have a voice too. Uh, but they did a lot of the peripheral things within the guild, whereas the masters were the ones who were the leaders and the ones who had voting power within the guild to determine action. Okay, And then a lot of times this was a stepping stone to go into civic government, to become a chancellor, a mayor, um, and uh, even a sheriff, a bailiff of, of the community. So these different types of positions that were in the community, uh, being a master within a guild would be a stepping stone then into civic government. So this is the process. Master, journeyman, I mean, excuse me, uh, apprentice, journeyman, and master. And, um, and it was very effective uh, to make sure someone actually knew their trade and knew it well. Okay? And so what happened out of this because of these different guilds? And we even see these types of places in the United States. For instance, when you go to Philadelphia, you visit a place called Carpenter's Hall. Carpenter's Hall is now called Independence Hall. It's um, there by the Constitutional Square where the Liberty Bell is and everything. And it's where the Declaration of Independence was um, signed. 
and it's also where our Constitution was written and eventually ratified into power. And so that Carpenter's Hall in the 1700s was actually a Carpenter's Guild. But it was the largest place because it was used for community meetings and things, so it was the largest place in Philadelphia for them to be able to meet and hold these meetings. But that's what it was originally called. And out of these guilds, what you have is a university, this concept of universities. And if you look here, this is basically the definition of a university from back in that time period. And we're talking all the way back to the 11th century, okay? So a community of teachers and scholars, that's basically the idea of a university. And, you know, some of you are planning on going to university, college, community college, and there's a lot of differences and people will give you um, definitions for each. But I'm going to tell you the basic difference between a college and a university today is that a college is a particular field of study, and it basically only deals with undergraduate. If you're going to go to a university, it means they have undergraduate programs as well as a separate master's level program. So a college has really no master's level. So when they get into that master level of study that's been separated from the general course in your general courses in your undergrad, then they could be declared a university. And what you see in a university is several colleges. College of Arts and Science, um, College of Humanities, things of that nature. And, um, and so all of those fit under the umbrella of the university. But in its original definition, basically, a university was something that came about because teachers got together and then students started to come to where those teachers were. Or the students got together and then the teachers came to where the students were. So community of teachers and scholars. And so uh, interest in teaching of specific subjects. So um, an educational guild or a university guild would be a group of teachers who are concerned about the same topic. And then people would come to that guild to learn about that specific topic, okay? And started as uh, what we said before as an educational guild. And this is a picture down at the bottom of the library in Wilagna, okay? And so if we look at this here, so the first and oldest university in the world started about 1088. And there's some discrepancies in that date depending on... Uh, uh, which resource you read, okay? But it's the oldest continually operated university in the world, and it started out as a student guild. So there was a group of students who got together in Italy, in Bologna, Italy, and said, hey, we want to bring teachers to us. And part of the problem was these students couldn't travel out through certain areas because they were all different foreign nationalities. So they got together and they said, we want to bring in a group of uh, teachers to teach us. Now, this is a student-led guild. So, in other words, who made all the rules? The students did. They set time periods. They set class schedules. They set uh, how relations would work, uh, the policies and procedures to get into the school, who would be accepted in the school. It was a student-run guild. And they brought teachers there. And over on the side, you see um, the symbol that's been their symbol since um, the 11th century. It's pretty cool. This is one of the main lecture rooms uh, on the picture here. Uh, it's really interesting. If I could have a classroom like this, I would, where the teacher stays down in the bottom and the students are around them. And then you're basically circulating and walking around talking to the students as you go. Uh, students can then have the opportunity to communicate back and forth through questions and answers. And then the teacher actually stays inside that little uh, fenced off area with a table there and that's where all their uh, teaching materials are. Books, uh, manipulatives or um, you know charts or posters or maps that they need to hold up. Okay, um, And so this eventually became a leading center of law. Okay, Leading center of law. And this was a student guild operation, rise of the university. And then we get to the next one, the University of Paris. Now, this was organized by a faculty guild. This was organized close to around the same time. It was actually more in the 12th century. Uh, some very important people uh, participated in the University of Paris. Uh, people like Philip II, who fought in the Third Crusade. Uh, Innocent III, who called for the Fourth Crusade and was considered the zenith of papal authority. He actually went to school here before it was the University of Paris and actually sanctioned uh, the University of Paris 
uh, later on. And then also um, St. Louis, uh, Louis the Ninth of France, also put a seal of approval on this university. So this has some incredible historical ties to this university. And uh, liberal arts and theology was its main emphasis. So Balagna was on law, liberal arts. What are liberal arts? Liberal arts deal with things like uh, reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, it also gets into rhetoric, uh, understanding language, how to speak, how to argue, how to debate. Um, and, um, and basically a liberal arts education back then was well-rounded. It was a little bit more rounded than more specifically with the theology or even uh, just dealing with law. Okay, but the fields of study that if you went to a university back then, so you came out of the educational guild, and by the time you get to the 1200s to 1300s, these schools are expanding, and most of the schools now have four areas. Now, the easiest one to get into, and the one that was the broadest, was the arts. And then as you went into the other ones, it got a little bit harder to get into, with theology being the hardest school to get into because they wanted to protect um, the study of theology, the study of God. Okay, so these are the four areas that we're going to uh, the, the four areas that they study: arts, medicine, law, and theology. Okay, and so we look at the College of Paris, which was liberal arts and theology. We look at the College of Bologna, which was mostly the study of law. Now, the next time we get into, we're going to get start getting into the philosophical ideas that come out of this time period. Okay, and that's our next step: the philosophies that began to come out of these universities during the time of the Renaissance, which eventually lead to the Reformation, uh, part of the Reformation study. Okay, so this is, concludes our lesson today, and uh, we'll see you next time for lesson four uh, as we get a little bit more on this journey in the Renaissance. All right, God bless. We'll see you next time.